Hi, I'm Michelle Sterling for Friends of Science Society. You know, a lot of the green faction are putting all their hopes on one gas for the future. Hydrogen, right? Remember your high school chemistry? H2, right? Hydrogen. Now, the whole idea of hydrogen being the fuel of the future appears to come from this fellow. Jeremy Rifkin. So, um, this book is titled, When There's No More Oil, The Hydrogen Economy. And he was a, an, he's an economist, he's not an engineer, and he's a futurist, uh, and he's been very influential. In fact, this book was translated into 36 different languages. It's called the Zero Marginal Cost Society. And in fact, he brags that he helped Germany set their energy and climate policies, <laughs> which I'm not sure people should be very proud of that today because Germany, thanks to their energy and climate policies, are now on the brink of disaster. They're in the late stages of degrowth and deindustrialization. So the thing is that the Canadian energy regulator has also planned our future around hydrogen. But when you look at the latest report from JP Morgan on energy, written by Michael Chimbalist, who's been an analyst for like 35 years, I think, you find that his view of hydrogen is quite different than uh, the view of the Canada Energy Regular later. Like, he's changed the name of hydrogen to hydrogen because you use so much energy trying to make hydrogen that you lose energy at every step of the way because hydrogen itself is not a fuel. It's an energy carrier. And there's a big, big difference. Um, so I'm going to try and explain some of these things to you, um, although it's a bit of a technical situation. But the other thing he's calling it is <laughs> he's calling it hydrogen because so many hydrogen companies are going bankrupt. It's a very complicated matter. Like the people who are proponents of hydrogen believe that there would be a huge demand because of the net zero goals. But it's very expensive to develop hydrogen facilities. The dream is, as we know in Canada, that you would have a wind farm and the wind farm would produce elect uh, the electricity for electrolysis and then you would split H2O into hydrogen and oxygen and then you would take that hydrogen and then you process it into ammonia and then you would ship it to Germany where you'd have a huge market for hydrogen. But in fact, it's not an easy thing to do. It's very complicated. And worst of all, hydrogen has a very strange property Aside from the fact that, you know, just like this helium balloon, which has similar lightweight qualities to hydrogen, just like this helium balloon is gradually losing helium because it's the smallest molecule in nature and it creeps out, hydrogen does the same thing. But when helium sneaks out, nothing happens. When hydrogen sneaks out, something terrible happens. It, uh, first of all, it embrittles things. So, metal things. So for instance, this is a metal pan that my mother loved to cook with. It made me lots of scrambled eggs, beans, warmed up cans of beans, leftover spaghetti, um, soup. This was the perfect pan for my mom. It's uh, stainless steel with a copper bottom and it's probably 70 or 80 years old, I don't know, maybe more. But this metal is still intact. I still use this pan. If it had been a pipeline 
filled with hydrogen, over time, the hydrogen has an ability to actually embrittle the metal. And that embrittlement creates little cracks. And then the hydrogen, just like the lightweight helium, sneaks out. And when it sneaks out, it creates its own static electricity, which can in turn ignite the hydrogen. Because helium is an inert gas. You can't light helium on fire. Hydrogen is extremely explosive, very difficult to handle. Now the irony is that in Alberta, we can and do make lots of hydrogen, but we make it from natural gas. And it's a methane reforming process, it's called. So we can do it fairly cheaply here. Um, and we do it for uh, various industrial purposes, but the principal purpose of hydrogen today is to make anhydrous ammonia fertilizer which helps feed probably 50% of the world. If we didn't have synthetic fertilizers, probably 50% of the world's population would die because we just wouldn't have enough productive crops. So there's a, a chemical engineer named Samuel Fafari. He's also a professor of um, energy geopolitics. And he's written lots of books. He, he wrote a two part tome. <laughs> this one, I, I'm not sure where part two is. I know I have it here, but uh, you know, he wrote these very interesting and uh, detailed books on energy and he calls hydrogen the hydrogen illusion. This book is also available in French. And he worked on trying to make hydrogen into a reliable mainstream form of energy for many years and realized that it's, it's just not going to happen. Um, perhaps one day there will be ways and means to keep hydrogen from you know, escaping um, pipes and embrittling them. There, there is a method today, but it's very, very expensive. You have to use extremely expensive um, linings on the pipelines. And the, uh, the problem is that there's always still these connectors which will not be lined and somewhere along the line it'll sneak out. But when you're making hydrogen in an industrial facility, you have instrument monitoring, you have trained people, you have very stringent safety protocols. But trying to put hydrogen in the hands of the public, in cars and such like, it's a very complicated and dangerous option. So um, there's a very good article on that by a hazmat expert engineer, and uh, that's on Science Klima et Energie. And so I'll post that link for that down below. And uh, Samuel Ferfari's book, and he's got a number of very funny articles about it too, because he talks about like the energy losses, and he says like for heating a home, using hydrogen is like burning Louis Vuitton handbags to keep warm. <laughs> that's how expensive it is. Um, so that's why hydrogen isn't really working out in the market as forecast. And yet, many of Canadian climate policies are based on the assumption that hydrogen will be a mainstream, totally viable a form of, of energy use in the near future. Um, and you have to realize that, you know, when you start changing systems in a society, there are lots of things that have to line up properly. For instance, um, ATCO states that they have a hydrogen um, heated home in a community near Edmonton. So one of our people uh, contacted their insurance agent and sent along a technical briefing on hydrogen and said, you know, if I bought this home, would you insure it? And the insurance company said no. <laughs> so we have on the one track the government and industry pushing and developing a certain type of technology or energy or change to our regular systems. And on the other hand, um, the insurance companies are saying, no, we're, we're not going to insure that. That's too dangerous. So I think that this is something that all people should look into. We have a report on our website by Robert Lyman about the Canada's climate policy fiasco on hydrogen. It shows that 
<clears throat> the, the methods proposed would cost 17 times more to make the hydrogen than conventional methods. Uh, that doesn't sound like affordable energy to me. It sounds like a disaster. And not to mention the other risks. So um, Ferfari's book is very quick read. It's very straightforward, plain language. I hope that people will get it. And I think that what we can decide is that this is not the path of the future. Sorry, hydrogen. Maybe, maybe if there's some new technology that comes along. But in the meantime, let's not waste a lot of time and money and energy and public funds on something that's pretty clear is not the way of the future. And something that's been promoted by a guy who's an economist and not a professional engineer. For Friends of Science Society, I'm Michelle Sterling. <laughs>